150,000. That's how many drug tests Victoria Police will be conducting over the next year. That means drug testing more drivers in more places more often. It's across all Victoria. TAC Towards Zero. The sun was rising for the third time since he had put to sea when the fish started to circle. He could not see by the slant of the line that the fish was circling. It was too early for that. Then looking out, out to sea, there was, uh, even in the rough conditions, there was one vessel out there, and it was a cray fisherman. Australian Federal Police Officer Des Appleby had a lot on his plate on the morning of April 16, 2003. He'd just arrested two men, Lee and Teng, and seized 50 kilograms of heroin that had been brought ashore in a dinghy the night before. Even at that size, it was one of the biggest heroin hauls in Victoria. OK, you've been placed under arrest because uh, we believe you're uh, part of an illegal act, namely the importation of a prohibited import into Australia. Do you understand that allegation? Yes. He had another suspect still on the run and a dead body on a nearby beach. It's a dead person. Holy shit. Des? Then there was the big cargo ship hanging around in heavy seas off Victoria's Great Ocean Road. This ship was called the Pong Su. Des had just received confirmation that it was from North Korea, a country that rarely, if ever, sends ships to Australia. And he desperately wanted to find a way to get out to her. The Pong Su was zigzagging back and forth along the coast, as if she was waiting for something, or someone. To their credit, they were trying to recover their man. They hadn't immediately abandoned him. They were trying to work it out how to do that. The police had no boats in the area and couldn't wait for a suitable one to arrive without risking the Pong Su taking off. All he could see out there, apart from the great hulk of the ship, was a fishing boat. So I'm standing there with the local policeman and um, pointed out to the boat and he said, oh, that's one of the locals. So he knew the fisherman. He said, do you want his number? <laughs> So I said, yes, I do, actually. So I rang the fisherman and, uh, and uh, explained who I was and what we were doing and what we were trying to achieve and go around to this, this vessel and see whether that we could board it. And uh, he was um, happy to assist. And then um, as he uh, had agreed to that, I, I just said to him, um, and it was just to let him know what he was really getting into or could get into, and I said, well, it, there might be a bit of um, gunplay or you know, it could get a bit ugly, you know, where we're going. And uh, he thought about it for a couple of seconds and said, no, no, still good. But just as Des and the crayfisher were about to head out, an unexpected arrival changed everything. Um, an Air Force Orion aircraft, one of the surveillance aircrafts, come hooking around the coast and it just missed the, the Pong Su um, radio tower and went, went further along the coast then came back and back along and just missed the Pong Su again and then, and then, then departed. Was the Orion intention? No, well, we, we, we asked um, the military and get, bear in mind, we're a civilian authority, so uh, the, the best response I got was that uh, it was a routine training mission. <laughs> no, I didn't know it was coming. But in seeing that military aircraft, the Pong Su just hit it. It just got out of there. So it's, it pointed to Bass Strait and just um, um, throttled down. Des was going to have to find another way to keep track of the ship, and quickly. For one thing, even though police now had Lee and Teng in custody, they hadn't recovered as much heroin as they were expecting. This made Des think that the remainder could still be on board the fleeing Pong Su. Over and above that, important people in the Australian capital of Canberra and as far away as Washington DC were demanding the Pong Su be kept in sight now that her true origin was known. It was a North Korean vessel off our coast and had been involved in a major drug matter and that just lit up government. With Des's crayfisher plan no longer an option, 
the job of chasing down the Pong Su fell firstly to police boats from other states. Well, it didn't have much of a head start because it was under hot pursuit. That's David Greaves, who was the Commodore of the Royal Australian Navy warship, the HMAS Stuart. We'll learn more about his central role shortly. As for the hot pursuit he mentioned, it's a term used in maritime law. If the operation took place on the high seas, um, we had no legitimate right to go and do that operation unless the hot pursuit had been maintained. So there's a strict legal requirement for that to take place. When the Pong Su suddenly powered away from Boggley Creek, she appeared to be heading out into the South Pacific towards New Zealand. So a police boat called Van Diemen from Australia's southernmost state, the island of Tasmania, was called in to shadow her. And the Van Diemen did this faithfully until Master Sun suddenly changed course. But no, it turned left and came north up the New South Wales coast. This manoeuvre meant the hot pursuit was passed from the Tasmanian police to the New South Wales police aboard a boat called Fearless. But to justify the hot pursuit, police first had to produce the evidence to connect the Pong Su with the commission of a crime, specifically to connect the ship to the rubber dinghy that had ended up on the beach at Boggley Creek. Celeste Johnson, the federal police's good luck charm, says she had to work fast. We had to um, demonstrate that there was a link between the dinghy and the Pong Su committing an offence in, in the Australian jurisdiction. So we had to demonstrate, yes, the dinghy came from that Pong Su, so the Pong Su under legislation was deemed to be a mothership. So being a mothership under maritime legislation can be directed into an Australian port. From the fearless, New South Wales police officers filmed the chase. Come on, Sue, if you do not stop your vessel or alter course, we will stop your vessel or the Australian government will stop your vessel using any method available. Master Sun had no intention of following directives from the New South Wales Water Police. Oh, no, he's making a run for it. Tell your captain... Their small boats were like sardines compared to the 106 metre long Pong Su. At this point, crew from the Pong Su began to jettison stuff from the ship in full view of police. As soon as they saw the police boat, they just saw him out the back uh, of the vessel just showering stuff into the water, yeah. <laughs> into the prop wash. No one knows what the crew threw overboard. Australian customs authorities did find some pirated DVDs in the water, one of the perks of working on the Pong Su. But the police had other things to think Here's about. Pong Su, here is police launch fearless. Are you altering course back to Eden Port over? As well as the Pong Su crew continuing to ignore their orders, the officers on the New South Wales police boat were dealing with seas so dangerous that lives were at risk. So we're going to run, it, we're gonna run out of uh, fuel and. and we just want to know what our next course of action uh, may be if uh, no one else comes to our assistance. The video shows waves smashing into the windscreen and the small police boat rising up and then crashing down with the enormous seas. I think it was Sea State 6. There was the um, Sydney to Hobart yacht race a couple of years prior where there were a number of deaths in the same sea state conditions. So experienced sailors uh, were very, very sick. It was that treacherous. Stop your vessel or slow your vessel and alter course back to Eden Port. Despite the risks, the crew of the New South Wales police boat had to keep going and maintain the hot pursuit. They were waiting to be relieved by a bigger ship, which is where Commodore Greaves comes in. I got a phone call in the afternoon, I think from memory, and it was from the Chief Staff Officer Operations in our headquarters in Sydney, uh, so he was a Navy captain, wanting me to go up to the headquarters and meet with the Admiral and meet with him. Uh, they didn't really tell me what it was about, and it was unusual to get a, a call like that. I met Commodore Greaves in the lobby of a Melbourne hotel. He was polite and good-natured and stood out in his immaculate white Naval officer's uniform. Commodore Greaves now serves as Chief of Staff of the Australian Navy's Strategic Command. Back in 2003, 
He was in charge of a serious Navy warship. They were a, a frigate, so they're designed to be all general purpose, and so this fits into that sort of field. Three and a half, three thousand tonnes, 118 metres long, five inch gun, harpoon missile system for eight of those for sort of anti-shipping uh, type capability. Evolved Sea Sparrow was your air defence missile system. Uh, a helicopter um, for both surface surveillance and ASW, anti-submarine warfare. You also have torpedoes on board, plus some self-defence, and then obviously your radars and surveillance assets. Ship's company, yeah, crew-wise, uh, 160. Commodore Greaves was briefed on what had taken place off Victoria's Great Ocean Road during his hastily convened meeting with the Admiral. Then the Admiral asked Commodore Greaves a question. And they asked me how quickly you can get your ship back together. Being Easter, some of the HMAS Stewart's crew were on leave. The frigate was also undergoing maintenance. Commodore Greaves said he could have the Stewart ready in 24 hours. You just kick into gear. So one of the things which we had in planned maintenance was the, the, the ship's five-inch gun. So it was all pulled apart for routine maintenance. Whether we needed the gun was not, you know, it was a, a thing which we didn't quite know but that was one of the things we had to start putting together again. News travels fast around dockyards, and because the Pong Su was now an international story, Australia couldn't risk the North Koreans learning a warship was being prepped for a special mission. So we had a story, which was that we were sailing for search and rescue down the Southern Ocean, So, which has been, you know, we've done that before, and so we use that as a cover story. But that didn't pass the sniff test with some of Commodore Greaves' crew. We didn't need the five-inch gun for a search and rescue mission. Um, and a couple of my maintainers and the gun were questioning about what was going on. And so I had to bring them into the confidence, now we're doing something else, but this is the cover story. You've been placed under arrest because uh, we believe you're uh, part of an illegal act, namely the importation of a prohibited import into Australia. Do you understand that allegation? Yes. You have the, the legal right to... Uh... But I did not do that. I did not do that. Okay. Back in Melbourne, police were also being fed some pretty far-fetched cover stories. Persons present are myself, a federal agent Morrison. If you could state your name, please. Mr. Lee Jin Guang. Okay. And what's your current occupation at the moment? Sales. Sales. Executive. Sales executive. Okay. And what what company is that for? It's from Diamond International. Okay. Is it a, is it a big company? Uh, not exactly. No. Do you get? Do you get? What? How do you get paid? Uh, by cash. In cash. Okay. Lee was educated at one yeah. of Singapore's best schools, the St Joseph's Institution, what and so was confident enough to do his police interview in English. Lam and Wong, by contrast, hardly understood a word police were saying, and Teng, well, his ability to speak English as demonstrated by his hiring of a car and making accommodation inquiries, deserted him. The upshot was that none of the men in custody were cooperating with police. Now, since arriving in Australia, just give us a rundown of what you've, what you've been doing so far. What have I been doing so far? Yeah. Relaxing myself, mm -hmm. going to the casino. Mm -hmm. Gambling? Gambling, yes. Yeah. Whereabouts have you been staying? Where have you been staying, sleeping? Um, in hotels. What, 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 what hotels? I can't really remember. A few of them. A have you got... Lee areas? told police that he only knew uh, Tang what? as Stanley. Stanley? Yep. Stanley. And do you know him as any other name? Do you know his name, full name? Not actually. I know him as Stanley because I, 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 I know this person in Melbourne's Crown Casino. You met him in Crown? Yeah, yeah, I met him in Crown. H how did you meet him? Oh, when we were gambling on the table, I said, mm -hmm. and just, just, just chit chat. Lee admitted other. going to Lawn on the day of the heroin import with Teng, aka Stanley. Yeah, and he told police he didn't know about anything that happened at Lawn because he'd never left his room at the Grand Pacific Hotel. But Lee wasn't so sure about his travelling companion. So Stanley was coming in and out, was he? Or was it only the once? Um, I can't remember exactly how many times. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Uh, 
So you're quite certain that you didn't travel in the car with Stanley at all that night? Yes, he, he, he left me at the apartment which I stay. Tiring of the charade. Mm-hmm. The police let Lee know you, they had an ace up their sleeve. No, got yes. the apartment. Okay, well, Mr. Lee, I'm telling telling you now mm-hmm. that for the past week, okay, well, thereabouts, we have had a listening device, okay, inside the Tarago. Okay. Okay. Your conversation, Stanley's conversation, anyone else near the car? Anyone else? Near anyone. Anyone in the area of that car? Okay. In the car. In the area of the car. In the area of the car. Okay. We ha- we listen to it. Okay. And record. Okay. Now, in light of that new information, is there is there anything that you wish to discuss with us? No. Later on, police would find out Lee wasn't even who he said he was. A word from our sponsor. 150,000. That's how many drug tests Victoria Police will be conducting over the next year. That means drug testing more drivers in more places more often. It's across all Victoria. TAC towards zero. Yes, there was going to be the special air service. You know, the tactical action group was going to be part of that. The HMAS Stewart not only had to intercept the Pong Su off the coast of New South Wales, it had to bring with it a squad of Australian Special Forces troops from Western Australia. The plan was to use helicopters and fast boats to board the North Korean ship. Commodore Greaves also brought Federal Police, New South Wales Police, Navy clearance divers and Army medicos along for the ride. It was a big job to get everything and everyone ready, and time was running short. We were actually able to launch our boats um, and teach the Special Forces how to drive our boats. You know, they were very skilled at driving boats, but they weren't skilled in launching from a Navy ship. So we spent Saturday doing some of those sorts of things, practising getting them into the boats, launching the boats, uh, and practice boarding operations uh, with the helicopter as well, uh, Saturday afternoon. You know, we were actually trailing the Pongsu by this stage. These practice runs were done over the horizon from the Pong Su. It had been four days since she abruptly steamed away from Boggley Creek, leaving Wong and a dead body behind. On board the Pong Su, radio operator Jong Dok Hong had been transcribing some messages the ship had received from North Korea two days after it took off from Boggley Creek on April 18. 0900 hour. Stop the ship and fight. 1210. Go to Sydney. Our embassy has been informed. 1710. Agreed to go into Sydney port. Our local embassy has also agreed. Strictly stick to the Tuvalu nationality and do not use our nationality. But the Pong Su was showing no sign of diverting to Sydney. The sequence started um, on the Sunday morning. So we had planned that we were going to do it at first light. So started getting light about 5, 5.30 in the morning. So that's when we started our approach. So we came in from over the horizon on our gas turbine, which is uh, our high-speed propulsion. So we had come in uh, very quickly and taken up station very close to the Pong Su so that we could hail them and use the radio as well to talk to them. This is Australian warship. I intend to board you. Over. Australian warship, this is motor vessel Pong Su. Flag of my honor is Democratic People's Republic of Korea. Over. The North Korean voice belongs to deckhand Ryong Gong Choi, the best English speaker on board. He and radio operator Jong Dok Hong, who could write in English, were both on their first voyage with the Pong Su. We had some communication with them. But they were sort of, I would characterise it by stalling. OK, you know, the, the captain is watching, watching and eating now, so waiting some moment. No, 
closer. Get them to the funnel now. I intend to board you. Over. Instead of playing along with the Pong Su's lame excuses, HMAS Stewart abruptly replaced their radio operator with a local radio station playing the theme song for its fishing show. This would have signalled to those on the Pong Su that something was up. So we did wait a, a few minutes, um, but then we executed the boarding operation, which was to put the special air service in the boats, launch the helicopter, and go for a coordinated approach to the ship. With its main gun manned, the HMAS Stewart sped straight towards the Pong Su. I was a child of a military family. My father did 35 years in the military, including serving in the SAS, so I always grew up around people in uniform. Tim Curtis was the commander of the Australian Special Air Service Squadron at the time of the 2003 Pong Su incident. The SAS are Australia's most elite troops. Serving under Tim in the squadron was Ben Pronk. I was an army brat as well, although my father never served in the SAS. He was a helicopter pilot. I first heard Tim and Ben speak about their role in the Pong Su incident on a podcast called Life on the Line, hosted by Alex Lloyd. Tim and Ben, and the rest of their squadron, were aboard the HMAS Stewart as it steamed after the Pong Su. Yeah, so it's just before Easter 2003, and we were actually closing up the, the counter-terrorist uh, special recovery squadron before the Easter break. And as we were sitting there in the conference room, um, centred uh, in the, the centre of the counter-terrorism squadron, there's a quadrangle and phones were ringing outside the room. You could hear them progressively ringing from the squadron headquarters through to the troop headquarter offices. And so finally we thought, well, we probably should pick up a telephone. And um, I was called up to regimental headquarters and the then acting commanding officer pretty much gave a warning order, which was incredibly informal. He said, uh, Tim, a North Korean drug vessel has just put some drugs ashore at a place called Lawn in Victoria, and a dead body has washed up on shore. I need you to prepare a component of the squadron to go and board and seize that vessel. Then Australian Prime Minister John Howard and his National Security Committee had decided the Pong Su warranted SAS involvement. But there was no time for an Australian Air Force aircraft to be arranged to take the SAS squadron, their weapons, ammunition and equipment, on a three and a half hour flight from Perth to Sydney. And while we were standing there doing some preliminary planning, one of the movement clerks walked in and handed us uh, Qantas tickets and said, your flight's in about an hour. We were down in about row 34F. We actually didn't have much intelligence and uh, our tactical planning commenced in the back of the in-flight Qantas magazine using the map and, and we were drawing up some options that we uh, wanted to present later that evening when we walked into headquarters special operations. The initial SAS plan was to board the Pong Su using a squadron of Black Hawk helicopters flown from the mainland of Australia. Nobody wanted to approach by boat. We had no desire whatsoever to put to sea given the horrendous sea state. The call to action came at an awkward time for Ben. At that point, I just started seeing my now wife and um, was supposed to pick her up from the airport that evening for the, the Easter holidays and it was going to be the first time I met her parents and I had to make this very rushed, awkward phone call as we were heading to the aeroplane um, that, you know, I'm, I'm not going to be able to pick you up and she sort of said, why not? I said, I've got to go away. She said, well, where are you going? I said, I can't tell you. When are you going to be back? I can't tell you. When will I see you? I can't see you. know, so it was this sort of... Um, awkward thing with this girl I was trying to court and, and uh, obviously didn't make a, a very good impression on her parents that first time. The plan devised on the pages of the Qantas magazine to get to the Pong Su by helicopter didn't go down too well with operational command in Sydney. Ben says there was doubt that the Black Hawks would even make it that far. The actual vessel was all over the place. I mean, it, it was clearly in an evasive pattern. It was heading out to sea. It was coming back in. Um, and there was concern even in our planning about 
the the reach, the ability to launch from a, a shore forward operating base. So Plan B was activated. Tim Curtis. And that particular plan was to board the frigate, use the frigate as a forward operating base, and then use embarked assets, that is the frigate's organic Seahawk helicopter and rigid inflatable boats. In other words, they were going to have to use a different helicopter that was already on board the Navy ship to get out to the Pong Su. The journey was barely underway when everyone's worst fears about the weather were confirmed. The conditions right from the outset as we came out of Sydney Heads was proving to be our worst nightmare. We were feeling quite sorry for ourselves until we saw the police vessel tailing this huge grain carrier, which the Pong Su was, and then we kind of thought, you know, we haven't got life too bad on this very large frigate. Uh, in contrast, their boat was tiny and getting thrown about like a cork in a bathtub. As the warship drew nearer to the Pong Su, the soldiers tried a practice run of the task they were about to undertake. It was only then that the real risks of the operation dawned upon Ben. There were a number of significant concerns about this plan, uh, not least of which was the, the sea state. The, the small craft had real dramas establishing ladders um, back onto the, the steward as it was, as the, the practice target vessel. And I can't remember exactly. I think we had 12 or 13 people in the back of that Seahawk. Now, if you've seen the back of a Seahawk, it's designed for about two or three people. So we were jammed in there. And I do remember thinking that, you know, if this helicopter goes down, um, then not many of us will be getting out. Then the SAS received some intelligence about the Pong Su and who might be waiting for them on board. Ben Pronk again. Into that atmosphere was injected this last minute intelligence <laughs> um, brief, which sort of said, given a number of factors, and our analysis indicates that this is a very abnormal vessel. Um, and uh, historical precedent is that, that there will be North Korean special forces on this. Um, I seem to recall they cited a case in Japan where a similar vessel had fired onto Japanese Coast Guard um, in a, a similar sort of boarding event. Tim says the Japanese experience was on his mind as he was crammed in the back of the Seahawk helicopter. When the North Korean Special Operations piloted vessel engaged the Japanese Coast Guard, they did it with a 50 caliber machine gun. That was probably the worst case scenario, maybe with one exception, a rocket propelled grenade that we could confront because the reality of a Seahawk is that it doesn't have any armour, no real defensive measures, and it wouldn't take a 50 calibre machine gun to bring that aircraft down. It would probably take nothing more than a 9mm pistol, well aimed. Everything and everyone was ready to go. The Australians were waiting upon the outcome of a phone hookup with Prime Minister Howard and his national security team in Canberra. Here's Tim again. And so the, the call from the bridge of the Stuart was actually to um, Duncan Lewis, who was sitting, as I understand it, in the same room as the Prime Minister. Duncan Lewis was Australia's Special Operations Commander in 2003. Now he's the head of Australia's spy agency, ASIO. At that stage, we had tried everything that we could to peacefully board it and easily board it. Um, and it became clear that the captain of the Pong Su wasn't going to permit that, so that's when the authorisation came. Ben was in the Seahawk helicopter when the order was given. And I passed the initiation code word, which was Valhalla now, go, go, go. So at that point, the, the Seahawk sped in over the horizon, synchronised with the boats breaking from the lee of the, um, the Stuart and heading in. And I remember from my, my cramped fetal position, I mean, you can imagine this is a, a adrenaline-filled sort of moment, so we're ready to go. The loadmaster's telling us how close we are. We've got 30 seconds. On the ocean below, SAS troops were speeding towards the Pong Su in their small, fast boats. At that point, I looked down and I, I'm, we're screaming over the, um, the boats who are, are heading in exactly the same direction towards the vessel. The Seahawk pilot was nothing short of incredible. Pulled this thing up in a very hard flare and 
It's at this point that, that normally, as soon as the helicopter stabilises, the fast ropes are dispatched and people start um, uh, assaulting as quickly as possible. But it took a long time to get into a, a decent hover. And the reason for that was there was a number of very prominent cargo derricks and the, the ship was static or moving very slowly, but certainly rolling in the, the high seas. And these derricks were, were swinging really violently. And so the, the Seahawk captain, to get us actually on a roping point, had to get in between these pitching derricks, um, which he eventually managed to do, but it, it took a lot of time. Uh, we eventually dispatched the ropes. I was super glad to get onto that, that fast rope. I think I was about the second out. I probably shouldn't have been as the commander, but I just wanted to get out of that, that helicopter. While Ben and his helicopter team were navigating their dangerous descent, the soldiers in the boats reached the Pong Su. Now they started to climb up ladders thrown up over the edge of the ship. To their surprise, when they finally got on deck, they were met by nothing much. No shots, no real resistance of any kind. Ben recalls that most of the Pongsu crew were older men. They looked like ordinary sailors, but a couple of younger guys stood out. Some of those kids were not like the others. You know, they were clearly just merchant seamen, sort of really scared shitless by the whole uh, process. And there were a couple that we, we thought were, were a bit more steely-eyed, a bit more, uh, I guess, guess, um, uh, you know, disciplined and, and um, less intimidated by the whole process, which certainly seemed to indicate some level of training. With the ship secured, the SAS handed over control to the federal police, who had come on board when it was safe to do so. The AFP once again started filming. The video makes for pretty sad viewing. It shows the Pongsu crew gathered in the galley with black-clad, machine-gun-toting, balaclava-wearing SAS men standing guard. The North Koreans look shocked and worn out. Some of them try to bury their heads in their arms on the table. Police then tap them on the shoulder or click their fingers to get them to face up to the camera. Something really stands out when you watch this footage. The crew are either young men in their 20s or craggy-faced older men approaching 60. There's no one in between. Master Sun wasn't in the galley with his crew. He was lying on a faded couch on the bridge with Australian Army medicos. He was complaining of a heart problem. Person Sharm here is the ship's master, who, as you can see, is currently being treated by Australian medical army doctors. As they steam back towards Sydney Harbour, Tim noticed something interesting going on in the Pong Su's radio room. So most modern ships have satellite communications. Well, the Pong Su didn't. It had a um, high frequency radio system and it was constantly receiving Morse code, um, which as a carrier wave signal is the uh, very efficient long distance form of communications. And uh, I actually radioed back to the steward and said, send me your best Morse operator. And um, a petty officer was winched on board. I said, how good is your Morse? He said, we don't really use Morse anymore. It's, it's rusty. I said, stand in this communications room. Here's a notebook. Don't touch anything and record everything that you possibly can that's being transmitted. There's a video of the Navy officer Tim's talking about trying to jot down the rapid fire Morse code. He shrugs his shoulders as he tries to keep up. I came back a few minutes later and said, how are you going? He said, they are transmitting so fast that I can't even copy um, down what's being written, you know, such as the, the use of, the effective use of, of Morse um, from North Korea. Police later found a message written out by the Pong Su's radio operator one he never got to send. It said, enemy has boarded on the ship. Someone disembarked from enemy's airplane. Neither Tim or Ben are still in the military. These days they run a business consultancy together. They even have their own podcast, The Unforgiving 60. No one really knows whether there was North Korean Special Forces on board the Pong Su, 
But if there was, my money would be on Wong and his friend who drowned in the surf at Boggley Creek. I just don't think more than $100 million worth of heroin would be entrusted to ordinary sailors. Here's Celeste Johnston's take on Wong's role. He wouldn't have been chosen for that aspect of the task without having a very high level of trust. He wouldn't have been committed to that responsibility without being a particular level. Des has similar thoughts about Lamb, the only man trusted by Wong and his partner to receive the drugs at the beach drop. Certainly Lamb um, does strike me as someone that, that, that would fit exactly that. He was um, maybe a sp- special forces operative or one of those sorts of people, but he was certainly um, had all the capabilities of doing what he did and he did it very effectively. Good evening to you. A ship believed to be at the centre of an international heroin smuggling operation tonight is under guard in Sydney Harbour. The North Korean freighter was captured in a joint military and police operation that ended... The Pong Su was taken into Sydney Harbour's Garden Island naval base. Behind it was the HMAS Stewart and a convoy of smaller boats. Once the Pong Su was docked, Des came on board to check out the scene. He saw Master Sun being led away by Australian Army personnel and out of sight of his crew. It was only then that Des realised how the scene appeared to the captive North Koreans. Things got a bit tense. The crew thought we brought him off and we actually took him out the back and shot him. So that's what they were thinking. They um, then got very agitated and it was nearly a riot on the vessel. So they're about to actually riot. Next thing you know, the, obviously the Special Forces guys were fairly agitated themselves and ready to um, basically deal with a riot, uh, including like full on drawing, cocking their weapons. So we managed to then talk to the crew as a group with the interpreters, and the interpreters actually talked them down, saying that the, that the captain hadn't been shot, hadn't been executed. For Des and Celeste, seeing the North Koreans up close, it became apparent the people they were dealing with were unlike any suspects they had ever encountered. And not just in their belief that the punishment for getting caught would be summary execution. They were fanatical about their leaders. Walking through the vessel, every, every cabin had two pictures of the, the dear leader and, and um, his father, and they were in pristine condition. So every cabin had two huge pictures, oh, at least about a metre by a metre. So, uh, and they all had pins, and the pins, the little lapel pins, the pins mean stuff to them, obviously, and, and depending on what pin you've got, is where you sit in the um, hierarchy of allegiance to the, to the government of North Korea. That level of commitment and loyalty to their country was so obvious after they were arrested and all of their clothing and personal belongings were taken from them and secured, obviously, but they all had pins of their leader, of Kim Jong-il and Kim Il-sun, on these little lapel pins, and that was all they cared about. That audio comes from a video of a federal police officer talking to one of the men from the Pong Su through a translator. The police officer is listing the items taken from him, including lapel pins, which had the images of North Korea's leaders on them. The man's upset when the pictures of Kim Jong-il and Kim Il-sung are placed face down on a nearby table. He gestures with his hands, they be turned to face the ceiling. The man pleads for his pins to be given back, telling the police officer and the interpreter that they are like his heart and that he'd die without them. This portrait is like my heart. They are so loyal and so dedicated to everything that's under their regime that taking those was a massive insult to them. Coming up, 
on the last voyage of the Pong Su. But yeah, they had time to put their stories together. They, the whole crew stuck to a story, a script. So we walked down into the bush and it was as accurate as five, four, three, two, one, we're here. And we all walked at our feet and it was a great pile of stuff. The division of 39 is uh, established and is running for the raising of the money for, for the Kim family. Did you ever have any concerns about your own personal security? Um, what do you think? Richard here. If you enjoyed this episode and want to hear more from Tim Curtis and Ben Pronk about life in the SAS and the boarding of the Pong Su, we've released our extended interview with them as a special bonus episode for Age and Sydney Morning Herald subscribers. Look in the episode description in your podcast player for the link. The Last Voyage of the Pong Su is brought to you by the newsrooms of The Age and the Sydney Morning Herald. To read more and to watch the videos referenced in this episode, head to our websites. While you're there, why not take out a subscription to help power independent Australian journalism and productions like this podcast. If you're enjoying this series, leave a review on iTunes and recommend us to a friend. The Last Voyage of the Pong Su is reported by Richard Baker. Field recording and audio editing by executive producer Rachel Dexter. Narrative consultant is Kate Cole Adams. Siobhan McHugh is consulting producer. Music and composition by Vicky Hansen. Sound design and mixing by John Greenfield. Extra production by Kelly Bergsma and Tim Mummery. And Tom McKendrick is head of audio. Thanks to our cast of actors, Chi Kwan Lee is played by Andy Song, Kyung Fa Teng is played by Anthony Ting, and Yao Kim Lam is played by Jason Chong. Casting by Catapult Casting. Script translations by Yan Zhuang. Additional audio from Channel 7. The reading you heard at the start of this episode was an excerpt from The Old Man and the Sea by Ernest Hemingway, read by Jason Chong. <laughs>